Nazareth. Now I ask that you at this time would turn to Galatians chapter 2. Our focus this morning will be on verses 17 through 21. However, for the context, we will read beginning at verse 15. So Galatians 2, beginning at verse 15. However, our focus will be from 17 on. Now, as you will remember from last week, Paul has just stated that justification is by faith alone in Christ alone. I'm sure you remember that. And remember that 3 a.m. test, what is justification? If I were to wake you up at 3 a.m., it is that God has declared us righteous. You are declared righteous in the sight of God, in Christ Jesus. But you can imagine when one preaches this doctrine, some objections might arise. People will begin to ask questions like, well, if I'm justified by grace alone through faith alone in Christ alone, I guess I can just go ahead and live however I want. This is a wonderful doctrine because it's a free pass for me to continue in sin and not change a thing about the way that I live. Or if I'm justified by grace alone through faith alone in Christ alone, if it's not my good works that save me, well, what's the place of the law in the life of the Christian? Does the law have Anything to say to us? These are the sorts of things that Paul wrestled with in his day, and it hasn't changed down to this very day. And it is these sorts of objections that the Apostle Paul wants us to understand this morning. But we are not just to understand these ideas in, a, in an academic sense alone. We are not to understand the doctrine of justification merely in an academic setting or in our minds alone. But what Paul is also going to show us this morning is that this great doctrine, which we need to have precision on, is also to have profound effects for how you and I live. And therefore, it is with this in mind that we turn to these verses this morning and we ask the question of them, what does justification mean on Monday? What does it mean throughout my daily life? Would you please stand out of reverence for God's holy word, beginning in Galatians chapter 2, verse 15. May God bless the reading and preaching of his word. We ourselves are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners. Yet we know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. So we also have believed in Christ Jesus in order to be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law. Because by works of the law, no one will be justified. But if, in our endeavor to be justified in Christ, we too were found to be sinners, is Christ then a servant of sin? Certainly not. For if I rebuild what I tore down, I prove myself to be a transgressor. For through the law I died to the law, so that I might live to God. I have been crucified with Christ, it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not nullify the grace of God, for if righteousness were through the law, then Christ died for no purpose. Thus ends the reading of God's holy word. May he bless the proclamation of it. You may be seated. This morning, if you were asked the question, why does having correct doctrine matter? Why does having right doctrine matter for you? Well, we might come up with different answers to that question. 
Some of us might say, well, right doctrine matters because it shapes how I feel. Or we might get a little closer to the right answer and say that right doctrine matters because of how it shapes the way I live. And there's truth, even in both of those, to some extent. But the real answer for why having correct doctrine really matters is because it exalts the glory of God. Having right doctrine is not first and foremost even about how I feel or even about how I live, but simply because God is to be glorified. And God tells us who He is. And we want to glorify Him. So Paul labors throughout this section of Galatians to get these doctrines right because he wants God to be glorified. He's specifically writing in the realm of salvation here. How is a person seen to be right in the face of a holy God? How is one to be justified? But the reason Paul is so tirelessly and zealously concerned with getting the doctrine of justification correct is because Paul wants God to be glorified in man's salvation. He does not want man to be glorified in man's salvation. He wants the Galatian people to know that their salvation is all about God's glory and not about themselves. And yet, at the same time, Paul is cautious that we not think that these right doctrines have no impact on our life. He does believe it should have an impact on your life. And so, these things are not at odds with one another, but rather it is one of priority. First and foremost, we strive to glorify God with right doctrine, with right thinking, but then that right doctrine must and ought to impact our lives, and that is what Paul is beginning to bring out here in verses 17 through 21. And therefore, we ask the question this morning, what does justification mean on Monday? What does it mean when you wake up tomorrow morning and you begin another week of life? We'll see three things this morning. Justification on Monday means that you hate your sin. Justification on Monday means that you love Christ's righteousness. And thirdly, justification on Monday means that you live for God, by God. You live for God, by God. So first, justification on Monday means that you hate your sin. We see this in verse 17. We read it now again. It says, but if in our endeavor to be justified in Christ, we too were found to be sinners. Is Christ then a servant of sin? Certainly not. So the objection that Paul is having to answer here in verse 17 is one that we've all probably seen in other people's lives and probably had to deal with in our own lives. If one is saved, if one is declared righteous in God's sight because of what Jesus has done, because of his good works and not my own good works, can I just continue in sin? Does it not matter how I live? People were accusing Paul of teaching that very thing all the way back when he was first preaching. As Mr. Scoglio read for us from Romans chapter 6, are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means, Romans 6.1. Or as they accused Paul in Romans 3.8, why not do evil that good may come, as some people slanderously charge us with saying, their condemnation is just, Paul says. So Paul was constantly being accused of this sort of thing, or at least with some regularity, and he's dealing with it here in Galatians 3 or 2.17. And how does he answer this question? Well, first, he does acknowledge that if you believe in justification by faith alone, you are a sinner. That's part of believing in that doctrine. You must believe that about yourself if you believe in justification. Why? Because the very fact that you need to be justified by somebody else says that you can't justify yourself. It says that you're a sinner 
and that you can't save yourself and you cannot put yourself in a savable state. You need the righteousness of somebody else. The very doctrine of justification proclaims this to us. And isn't that what Paul says? He says, if in our endeavor to be justified in Christ, we too were found to be sinners. Paul is acknowledging that he and Peter and all who believe in this doctrine find that they are sinners. You are, in fact, a sinner. And you acknowledge that if you really believe this doctrine. Now, the problem is not with justification. The reason that we're sinners isn't because justification is a true doctrine. The problem is us. We are the problem. Kids here this morning, imagine you get up to go to school tomorrow and your hair is all over the place. It's disheveled. And then you go and you look in the mirror and you suddenly realize, my hair's a mess. The problem, as you know, kids, is not the mirror. The problem is your hair. And that's what Paul is saying here. He's saying, yes, when I trusted in Christ, I realized I was a sinner. But the problem wasn't this great trust in Christ. It wasn't this great righteousness. It wasn't this great doctrine of justification. The problem is that I was a sinner. This was my only hope. It was this or it was nothing. And we want to notice as well that where is this justification centered? It is centered in Christ. Look at verse 17 again. But if in our endeavor to be justified in Christ. In other words, beloved, we want to see the centrality of Christ in the doctrine of justification. This has been stressed many times in the last several sermons I have preached, but it's because it must be stressed. When you look at Paul's writings... Union with Christ is what matters most. That is at the center. All those glorious things that come from it, justification, adoption, sanctification, one day glorification, those in and of themselves as mere ideas can redeem no one. It can save no one. What we need is union with Christ. Remember last week we stressed that we are justified not just by faith, in the abstract, but faith in Christ. And here this morning we see again that we are justified not by merely thinking we are or wanting to be or wishing we were or somebody saying something about this beautiful doctrine. No, it is tied intimately to Jesus Christ. We are justified in Christ and in Christ alone. And if you have not faith in him, you have not justification. But I thought we were supposed to learn about what this meant on Monday. I'm not sure that I've done that yet. What does this mean for us on Monday, beloved? This truth that we are declared righteous because of what Christ has done in our place, this truth, does it not make Jesus lovely? Does it not make him more precious to you and more dear to you than your closest friends, than your spouse, than your children? That Christ would take on himself my sins? Does this not make me want to hate sin, to destroy sin, to have nothing to do with sin? Because when I sin, I make little of the cross of Christ. I say it was not all that great what Jesus did on that day when he bore my sins on that cross. I say, thank you, Jesus, for taking my sins, and I'll just keep on sinning. Somebody who understands justification in their souls won't want to live like that. You won't want to hate your sin because he took that sin on himself, the sin that you've committed, sins that I have committed, that very nature of lawlessness which reigns within us apart from his grace. We want nothing to do with our sin. How does this affect us on Monday? Well, it stirs up in us a zeal to hate our sins because of the preciousness of our Savior. One author put it like this. I read years ago and just has always stuck with me. Oh, what is that cross on the back of Christ? My sins. Oh, what is that crown on the head of Christ? My sins. Oh, what is the nail in the right hand and the other in the left of Christ? My sins. Oh, what is that spear in the side of Christ? 
my sins. What are those nails and those wounds in the feet of Christ? My sins, oh my sins, oh my sins, oh my sins. We don't want to even commit the smallest sin knowing that it is against this Jesus who, in whom we have been declared righteous. Even the smallest sin should be heartbreaking to us because it is against our great suffering Savior, Jesus. And why this morning should you hate your sins most? What is the deepest motivation here for you this morning in your actual life? What is the deepest motivation for you to hate your sins? I suspect for most of us, it is the consequences of our sins. We would be so embarrassed if people found out about some thing or some things that we have done. We hate the consequences of our sin, the way that it destroys our marriages the way it crushes our relationships with our children. It may cause us problems at work. We may hate our sins because we know that if gone unchecked, they could lead to us going to prison or even to receiving the death penalty. Beloved, any unbeliever could hate their sins for the same reasons. Anybody who doesn't know Christ could hate their sins for the exact same reasons. An unbeliever may not want their marriage destroyed either. They may not desire that their relationship with their children is tarnished either. They may not want to be embarrassed if their sins are found out. They surely don't want to go to jail or receive the death penalty. What is the ultimate motivation for us to hate our sins? It is the glory of God. We hate our sins because they are an offense to the glory of God. We say with David in Psalm 51, against you and you only have I sinned. Our greatest concern isn't what it would cost us in this life if our sins were found out. Our greatest concern is the fact that when we did those sins, when we think those thoughts, we're offending our holy God we are offending his glory and we are making light of the cross of Jesus Christ in which he bore our sins. So on Monday morning, may the precious truth that Christ has taken on your sins stir you up and spur you on, beloved, to want nothing to do with your sins. But secondly, on Monday morning, Justification means that you love Christ's righteousness. You love Christ's righteousness. We see this in verses 18 through the beginning of verse 19. These verses admittedly are not the most simple. So what does verse 18 mean? Let's read it again. For if I rebuild what I tore down, I prove myself to be a transgressor. Here Paul is declaring that if he rebuilds what he tore down, if he returns to trying to save himself by his works, all he will do if he tries to return to that way of living, that self-righteousness that he was immersed in as a Pharisee, if he returns to that way of living by the law, for his justification, for his right standing before God, all he will do is prove himself to be a transgressor. Why? Well, ultimately, at least for this one reason, because he's going to keep failing, won't he? He's going to keep trying to keep the laws that he already is breaking, and he's going to prove that he can't do it again and again and again, that he cannot find his righteousness before a holy God in himself. He will continually find himself to be a transgressor. And then he goes on in verse 19 to say, For through the law I died to the law. What is Paul saying here? He's saying that the reason he cannot be saved by law-keeping by his own merit, is because 
It is the very law that he is trying to keep that is going to kill him. The law, in other words, was never meant to be a means that Paul would pursue to save himself. Because he cannot do it, all the law will do is slay him. The law cannot save the apostle Paul. One author put it like this, The thrust is that the law is in no position to give man what it demands of him. The law is in no position to give man what it demands of him. All it can do is demand to forbid, to judge, and to condemn. So it is that man dies through the law. He is beaten to death by it and falls into God's judgment. The law will beat you to death and you will fall into God's judgment and you will receive the just consequences when you try to obtain righteousness by the law, which is the eternal wrath of God, because you will not succeed. That's Paul's point here. It's through this law that he died. But what's the problem? Is the problem the law? Again, was the problem justification? No, the problem is not God's law. The problem is that we are sinners. The problem is you. The problem is me. God's law is not the problem. Paul says, I recall it is in Romans 7, that the law is good and righteous, and pure. The law is good, and righteous, and pure. It is not the problem. The problem is us. Imagine again here this morning, young ones, that you decide you want to um, examine more closely a dirty plate. And so you find yourself a magnifying glass, and you begin to examine more closely this dirty plate, and all of a sudden it turns out the plate's more dirty than you ever realized. When you put that magnifying glass on it, all of a sudden you're seeing dirt on that plate that you didn't even know was there. Now, did the magnifying glass put the dirt there? Did the magnifying glass make the plate more dirty? Absolutely not. All it did was reveal the gross dirt that was already there on the nasty plate. And so it is with the law of God. I promise you, beloved, as you learn God's law more and as I learn it more, it's not going to make me more sinful But it will reveal to me the great sins that are already in me. And it will do the same for you too. The more you understand God's law, it will slay you. But it ought to slay you to Christ, you see. It ought to crush you of self and crush you to Jesus. And that's what Paul is saying the law did to him here. When he tried to find salvation in his law keeping, it crushed him. It destroyed him and it drove him out of himself unto Christ. But Paul here is not saying the law is bad. Paul is saying that the law is good, but that it is not something we should go to as a means of saving ourselves. We go to Christ for that. And then Christ directs us back to the law to shape our way of life. Well, when was Paul ultimately killed to the law? He was killed to the law when the law was placed on his Savior in his stead. Look with me at Galatians 3.13 for a moment. When Christ took on the curse of the law on himself, Galatians 3.13, the penalty of the law was destroyed in Jesus for Paul and for all of the elect. Galatians 3.13, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, that is the death that we deserve, by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree. Now again, I thought we were supposed to learn here what in the world justification would mean for my daily life. Well, you see, our inability to keep the law, as Paul is showing us here, should make us rejoice in the righteousness of Christ. Do you love the righteousness of Jesus? Do you love the righteousness of Jesus? Can you imagine how much you've sinned? I cannot imagine how much you have sinned and how much I have sinned. Can you imagine how much we have sinned? We break God's law every day in thought, word, and deed in ways we don't even know and in ways we do know. Our law breaking is tremendous. Can you believe that Christ obeyed it from his heart perfectly? The law demands of you and me perfect, personal, perpetual obedience. 
from the heart with pure motives. You haven't done that, and neither have I. One of the ways I have particularly found this to be a profound thing to contemplate is, is just this, and you can apply it to everything in the world. But think about when you were a child, or if you're a child, and think about now that you are a child. Have you ever dishonored your parents? That's the fifth commandment. I promise you have a lot. So have I. Right? You've dishonored your parents. Okay, well, one of the reasons you tend to do that or have done that in your life is because you think that you know better than your parents, despite the fact that they've lived multiple times over the amount of time that you've lived, but somehow you've realized that you might actually know better than them. And so you don't want to submit to them. Well, think about just that one law, and that one commandment in light of who Jesus was. You know that he actually knew better than his parents? That he actually knew all things, that he actually was all-powerful, and yet he said in Luke 2, at the end of Luke 2, I will submit to you. He submitted to his parents. Can you imagine? I mean, it's hard enough for us to submit to peers when we think we know better than them. When you're a child, you, you, you would disobey a thousand times. If you were Christ, you would, you, would have, you would not have done it. You would have failed tremendously. That's just one commandment, and, and you can apply that to every single commandment. If you just take a few moments to think about what it meant for Christ to actually be perfect, it is astonishing. And that's what you and I need. So on Monday, you grumble, you complain, you become self-centered, angry, bitter, Every time you sin, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and then back around next Sunday, you say to yourself, Christ fulfilled the law in my place. He was righteous for me. How amazing is that? He has fulfilled the law's demands in my place. His righteousness for me. That is my only hope. And you will say, I don't want to keep living like this. I want to grow out of this. I want to become more like him. I know I fall short, but my standing with God will not change. My righteousness is secured because it's in Christ. But I do long to be more like my Jesus. I do endeavor to be more like my Christ. And so you press on and you look to Christ again and again and again in his righteousness. Thirdly, justification on Monday means we live for God, by God. We see this at the end of verse 19 through 21. End of verse 19, after mentioning that he has been dead to the law, he says, so that I might live to God. There Paul declares that he now, having died to the law as an instrument of salvation, he now lives to or lives for God. And how does Paul do this? It's important to notice that Paul does not now live for God in his own strength. All throughout verse 20 into verse 21, Paul repeatedly teaches us in one way and then another way that as he now lives for God, he does not do it in his own strength, but rather he does it by God. So he lives for God, by God. Let us see this for a moment by examining verse 20. He declares here that he has been crucified with Christ. He didn't crucify himself. Christ was crucified in his place. It is no longer I who live, Paul says, but Christ who lives in me. It is not Paul's strength that he is trusting in, but the strength of Christ who now lives in him. That is where Paul will find his strength to live for God. And yet, Paul does still actually live and breathe and have a physical being, doesn't he? And so he goes on, in the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God. So Paul is directing his strength to live for God, by God. It is by God himself that Paul will have success in his endeavors to live for him. And when he talks about faith here, notice that is, this is the way of his life. I live by faith in the Son of God. So often in our modern thinking, we have made it seem to be the case that faith is merely something that was done many years ago in our lives. 
Faith was something that is done merely at conversion or salvation when we trust in Christ for our salvation. And that much is true. That is the beginning of faith. But that is not where it ends. Faith is one thing that we continue to exercise for the entirety of our lives. Paul lived by faith in the Son of God. And notice the object, again, of his faith is not himself or anything in himself. It's not even his good works. It's not even his best days. His faith is not in himself whatsoever, but in the Son of God. True faith, as somebody I heard put it this way, true faith is not morbidly introspective. It's not morbidly introspective, looking in at myself and sort of tearing away every possible mixed motive and uncertain desire. We do need to be examining ourselves, 2 Corinthians 13, 5. But, but it's not morbidly introspective. True faith is extrospective. It looks away from the self and it looks unto Jesus. That is where true faith is to direct itself. And that is what Paul is stating here. And he goes on in verse 21 to declare one last time in case anyone missed it. I do not nullify the grace of God. For if righteousness were through the law, then Christ died for no purpose. If we could save ourselves, then why did Jesus come? One person said if we could save ourselves and Jesus still came, then God would be guilty of throwing himself away. But notice just before those words in 21, he talks about how this faith that is in the Son of God is not just in any Son of God, but, but, but specifically who loved me and gave himself for me. He loved me and gave himself for me. I want to return to that quote earlier about our sins, where the author said, oh my sins, oh my sins, oh my sins, and I want to change it a little bit for us. And hopefully it'll help us understand what Paul is talking about here when he discusses the love of God. Oh, what is that cross on the back of Christ? My sins. Oh, that I, a sinner, would still be loved by this Christ, that he would take my sins on himself. Oh, what is that crown on the head of Christ? My sins. My sins that he loved me. So much that he gave himself for me and for my sins. Oh, what is the nail in the right hand and the other in the left of Christ? Oh, my sins, my sins and the fact that he loved me so much that he gave himself up for me. What is that spear in the side of Christ? My sins, what are those nails in the wounds of the, of the feet of Christ? My sins, oh my sins, oh my sins, that he would love me so much, so much, me, a sinner like me, a sinner so unworthy as me, that he would take on my sins. You see, you will not understand Paul's amazement at the love of Christ for him unless you understand that you are a sinner. And that is why Paul could say, for me, he could say, for me, for me, with great joy and excitement because he knew he wasn't worthy of it. He couldn't believe that it would be true that God would have love for him in Christ Jesus. What does this mean for us on Monday? Well, do you see how God-centered Paul's life was? When Paul studied great doctrines, they led to true devotion and his life was God-centered. Why this morning do you want to live more righteously, I ask? Why today do you want to live a more righteous life? Probably many of us would say we want to live more righteously, but why? What is the ultimate motive? Ultimately, you have two foundational motives for a longing to live a righteous life. And it is just this. It's either man-centered or it's God-centered. And if it's man-centered, it's not righteousness at all. You see... Paul used to live a very righteous life. Philippians 3, you can go read it. But he wasn't even beginning to live righteously. How can I say that? Because all of his righteousness was for his own sake, not for God's glory. 
Why do you want to sin less? Why do you want to live a more righteous life here this morning? If it's for yourself, it's not really righteousness. God, Paul says, live for God because he loved you and gave himself up for you. Live for God because you love God, because you're concerned about his glory. That should be the underlying primary motivation for you to live a righteous life. It is for the glory of God. That is why we should long to live a righteous life. We bring our time to a close this morning. We've seen that justification means on Monday that we should hate our sins, that we should live in thanksgiving for Christ's righteousness, and we should live for God, by God. And beloved, one thing that you see in Paul and one thing that I hope we all long for here this morning is to have a God-entranced life. Paul is just overwhelmed with who God is. And it propels him to holiness. It propels him to despise sin. It propels him to love Jesus, to live for him. But it's all ultimately because Paul was entranced absolutely entranced in who God is. Do we this morning ever find ourselves entranced with who God is? Loving Him simply in awe of who He is? It's convicting. But beloved, though we're not as entranced as we'd like to be, Surely I hope you want to be more entranced. I know that I do. Your righteousness here this morning is founded in Christ. Put your faith in Christ.